hello, 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 and welcome to my little, what should I call these, little mini PDs or mini teaching tips, something, because I don't do teaching tip Tuesday during the summer times for obvious reason, but I am going to get back on my YouTube channel. Um, right now, I am um, live streaming. I'm on Facebook on my computer and on uh, Instagram on my phone. I'm trying to kill two birds really with one stone. And this hair, it's hot and I have these lights on. So if you see me fanning, yeah, it's hot in Texas. It is about 102 degrees today, so it was 101 yesterday, so it is hot. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, if you're on Instagram and you're um, watching this live, go ahead in the comment section, tell me what you teach and where you're tuning in from if you're on Facebook. Do the same in the comment section. Just tell me where you are tuning in from and what do you teach. So, I am so happy that you all could join me. What today's live stream or mini sold or mini PD, whatever you want to call it, it's about teaching for growth versus teaching for proficiency. And you're probably saying, well, why would I teach for growth and not proficiency? Let me see. Um, well, it's easy. If you work it at a campus where there are children that are below grade level. Now, I have worked in um, underprivileged and underserved. Hey Sue. Hey Wendy. Um, I've worked in underserved communities my entire uh, career. Even when I first started, I'm in year 22 and I started teaching in 1999. So it has been a long time since I first started teaching. And there are schools where students are not on grade level and not just pockets of students. We're talking about classes of students that are working below grade level. So I'm going to talk about, I got my test scores back. If you are new here, if you just met me, I'm Michelle, AKA the Ignited Teacher. And I teach algebra one and eighth grade math this year. Um, so if you're just meeting me for the first time, I used to be an elementary teacher. And like, a lot of people are like, oh, well, how did you get to high school? It's a long story. <laughs> so I left the classroom for two years. I was math instructional coach, AKA a master teacher. And I just started teaching math only. I love mathematics, but I also love science as well. So that's how I, you know, I've done different things. I was a math interventionist at the high school level for two, year, I, two years. I did algebra one support. I taught all levels of elementary except for um, kindergarten. So I have that experience. And now I've taught um, all levels of <laughs> second, I mean, middle school. So my range is a lot different than most. I have a lot of experience and different things and I have a love for learning. So that's my introduction. And this right here, it, at the end of the school year, these test scores, they came back so late. We didn't get out until June. So they came back late and some teachers in our district, they were talking about their test scores. And actually the state of Texas, they decreased the um, actual uh, percentage to pass. So they basically dropped it, um, which they always do. They always move the goalposts. If the kids do too well, 
they make it higher. If the kids don't do well enough, they make the um, passing score lower. So that's, that's the smoke and mirrors of standardized testing. Now, I'm not going to get in a debate about standardized testing because I don't agree with it. However, it's what our students are up against. And there's nothing that we can do about it until parents get on board with pushing back on so much testing. Well, since I taught Algebra 1, my kids had to take ELC to pass. Now, it has been a difficult year. So I had 22 kids, and then my 8th graders, you're talking about ginormous gaps. I told my students at the end of the school year, they almost, like this school year almost made me quit. I was looking at working somewhere else or just quitting teaching altogether. It was the most difficult school year of my entire career. Now, I and I've been teaching for 22 years. It was like by far the worst. The gaps that the students had were not just misconceptions, and that's what we're generally used to, but... They were missing instruction on top of misconceptions, which I was not used to. I'm gonna be honest with you. It was crazy. It really was. So what I've always done in the past is, you know, I always look at my kids and I'm like, either they're going to be a proficient student, meaning they're going to pass outright or they're going to be a growth student. So the way that our schools are um, actually, our accountability rating, we have domain three and two and three, and those are growth domains. So closing a gap is three, and I think the other one is um, economic kids. Um, how are they doing? So. My eighth graders, along with my colleague, we hit domains two and three, which is the equivalent of hitting domain one, which is for proficiency. Now, it was different for ELA. You're probably talking about, well, this is math. Why are you talking about ELA? Because ELA hit domain one, which is proficiency, and missed domain two and three. And I'm going to talk about that. So when we teach... There's that bell curve, and you're probably already aware of that. Yeah, the gaps by high school, are, yes, it's horrible. Um, that bell curve, and generally a lot of teachers teach to that median. But here's the kid thing. You miss the kids up here, and you miss the kids down here. So that's what happened in ELA. They taught to that median student. And a lot of your resources that we have out there for mathematics, they will hit the bell curve kids too. So that's why I'm bringing that up. But if you're teaching for growth, and I'm going to tell you what happened on these test scores this year. So I think it was like December. And I told my colleague, I said, you know what? I am going to make a decision. I said I was pushing the kids. It wasn't working. Like they were frustrated and I could see it every day. So what I did is I said, I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to slow the pacing down and then I'm going to teach through the vertical alignment for the eighth grade concepts. And I had to do it for algebra one, two as well. But they had different skill set than my eighth graders. So what I did is I like for proportions, I went in and went to my sixth grade teacher in our building. She's on third floor and was getting um, material for her from her for proportions. So I would do a mini lesson, do an ed puzzle, then teach the eighth grade concept. And that's what I did throughout the school year. And I just told her, I said, either what I'm doing is going to work and the kids are going to come out okay, or either what I'm doing is going to fail, <laughs> not going to work, and the kids are going to fail. So, ta-da, it worked.
it actually worked. So I was so happy. So the kids were behind and I my roster got flipped. So if you know, around the country, we were short of teachers. And we had to close one section of mathematics for eighth grade math. So that put us down two kid, two to two teachers instead of three. And they moved one of our teachers to um, seventh grade. So um, seventh grade, thank you. Seventh grade, um, so I ended up, clo they ended up closing one section of my algebra one class and giving me three, three eighth grade classes. Not only did it change the kids, it changed the demographics. So I ended up with more ELL kids and I did my numbers. So at, in December, no, not even December, in February, I had, I was at 12% proficient, meaning that kids, at approaches or higher um, where they the school could get points so out of those kids because I only had like 13 kids out of 70 that were <laughs> making and I'm laughing because it was crazy but then at the end of when I got my scores back I had 31 kids that actually passed the star test and 40% of my students hit their growth measure. So when I say that there's a difference in teaching for growth versus proficiency, as a teacher, you have to make that decision. So you're probably asking, well, how does this work? So it's in this math intervention cycle, and you probably have seen me talk about it. So it is the assess, diagnose, reteach, and reassess. That is what I do constantly. And, it, and a lot of teachers think, oh, I have to give this test. No, I don't, you don't have to give a test. I use plickers to assess my students formatively to give me the data that I need. And I don't just do one question. I look at the questions and I make sure that they are at the rigor of the student expectation. And I give it to them to see. And people are saying, well, how do you figure out? Um, I, oh, I use Plickers. So on Plickers, um, let me see. Plickers.com. On Plickers, I actually, uh, oh, I left off the S. Plickers.com, it's a free formative assessment tool. All you have to do is put in your own test questions. So I will s screenshot pictures from different um, resources, some from release tests, all of that. So... Uh, what I look at is, are the students choosing? So I teach my kids about distractors. So a distractor is a little a answer choice that's a little bit of right and a little bit of wrong. Well, the kids have to decipher, um, yes, clickers, have to decipher whether or not they can determine which is the distractor. And it tells me about the students and what they know about the concept. If they pick a, a question or answer choice that is outlandish, I know they know nothing. I know I need to go back and reteach because they're, te they're, they're choosing answers that make no sense. So I divide these kids into growth and proficient kids. And what I do is look at where they are to see if they are growing. So some of my kids have growth. Um, they have, hey, you need to increase your, your score. You need to get more questions correct. So we have those kids that are growing. Then I have my proficient kids that they actually have a percentage that they need to hit every time they take a test, a quiz, whatever the case may be. And that's how I manage 
especially the stress of testing. All of the kids are not going to pass. And you're going to, if you have a low, low group of kids, you're going to have to choose a growth, um, a growth target. That's what you're looking for. And then it'll surprise you. Cause I'm gonna be honest with you. When I looked at this list, some of the kids, like I had kids that would skip all the other teachers classes and come to my class. And one of the boys didn't end up passing, but he didn't do not an ounce of work. He failed my class, but he actually passed the standardized test, which I thought was bananas. But um, that's the difference, like teaching for growth, using that vertical alignment. And you're probably saying, well, what is the vertical alignment? This is what the vertical alignment looks like. So this is for distributive property. And I actually had to use this this year. I actually had to use this with my Algebra 1 kids. I started with third grade columns and rows, six times three. And then I broke it down and put it into six plus, oh, plus, and it had open parentheses times 12. Um, so distributing that six to, I think that's a one and to the 12 and, or three to the 12. And then fourth grade, it goes to the area model. And then in sixth grade, because distributive property in Texas is taught in sixth grade, but they seventh grade is not really big, but eighth grade, they actually use it. But, um, so in Algebra 1, they it's new, but the kids have to use it in conjunction with those equations. Will this be on your YouTube channel? Yes, I will be talking about this as school the school year begins um, on the vertical alignment and closing gaps. So this is where you start, and this is this will help you get the growth that you need. Um, I actually teach this in my math intervention academy because if you teach through the vertical alignment, it moves things a lot quicker. You're not trying to teach the whole curriculum. You're just trying to close gaps. You know, we're closing gaps and we're moving on. So say for instance, the kids don't need it in third grade, need the third grade. They got that. You can choose between fourth and the sixth grade model. Now, one of the things with closing gaps and teaching for growth, you the biggest problem is finding where you need to begin. And that takes, you know, a little bit of studying. I've taught so many grade levels, I generally know where to begin. But if you don't, use your colleagues as a resource. Because it's not, if you are a fifth grade teacher and you're like, okay, these kids don't know multiplication, where does teaching multiplication begin? Go down to second grade teach because they start in second. Then look at the third grade and then look at fourth and determine what's missing. But you have to have student work and you have to have the kids doing things and talking about stuff so that you can get a gauge formatively and adjust your instruction on the fly. So if... As we go into um, summertime, uh, I'll be having a webinar on understanding. Yes, do you have a comprehensive test that addresses multiple grade level standards? No, I generally don't. I'm gonna tell you what I've been doing the last couple of years. I have a subscription to Moby Max and then Moby Max has a free version. I give them that test. That test is Design for struggling learners. Let me put it here. And it tells me what grade level they're at. So that's generally how I get a gauge where my kids are at. And then I start observation um, because data, you can't really depend on the test. It just gives you a starting point. But the observations are really what I look at to gauge where the kids are. And I just do a lot of different things. 
I know some teachers like paper. I'm not a paper person in testing the kids. Um, I like to see their work and I guess I'm going to bring out some of the stuff that I've done. Um, I'm going to have to go up to the school. No, I got some books here um, to really address whether the kids are. I really like, I think next year I'm going to start with rubrics to see where the kids are at a conceptual level. And that's really what I've been trying to do is move away from testing the kids to where I get an authentic uh, picture and true picture of what they can do. So that's what I've been trying to move closer to, um, giving them a task and then having them work it out. Um, and I do a lot of the technology stuff. So thank you all on Instagram for tuning in. I have started kickboxing again and I am going to get dressed and get out of here and go hit the bag. So if you have any questions, you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, don't, don't hesitate to drop a comment or send me a DM and I will definitely answer it when I can. Thanks again. See you soon. Bye-bye.